This is, um, this is called How It Happened, with apologies to Sam Shepard. <laughs> I would see her in the hallways, clutching her books and binder close to her chest, moving faster than most of the other kids, like she was in a big hurry. Sometimes she would stop, and giggle with some dumb chick, and then move on, her face returning to her usual expression, solemn, proud, a little scared. I'd scope her hair, blonde with a mist of red. You noticed when she stepped through a blast of sunlight. And man, I would go after that flag of her hair like she was a calf bolting from the chute. I knew it was stupid, but sometimes I'd make a lariat gesture. Just for myself, a little spin by my head. <laughs> Toss that rope over the heads of all those shuffling kids milling around. And that noose would pass right over her head. And her shoulders settling just below her breasts. And I'd cinch it up good. <laughs> but of course, she just keep moving. Slipping into science class. Later, after we had kissed by her locker, after we had groped all over each other's bodies, thrashing like two trout, tossed in one of those wicker baskets fishermen used to hold their catch. But long before we found out, she put her hands on my shoulders, me kneeling in front of her after sipping iridescent droplets of water off the reddish thatch crowning her pussy both of us still dripping from a dip in the icy pond, still sweating from our ecstatic exertions, naked as jaybirds, as my dad would say. My hands cupping her ass, the skin rough with goosebumps, but smooth as silk. Precious rain dripped, splashing on my upturned face like a benediction and she dove into my eyes. That look of gratitude and fury she always carried around. Mm -hmm. And then she whispered, never put a girl on a pedestal. It makes it too easy for you to kick her in the teeth, for her to kick you in the teeth. <laughs> Let me do that one more time. <laughs> She whispered, never put a girl on a pedestal. It makes it too easy for her to kick you in the teeth. I gave her my snaggletooth grin and said simply, when it comes to you, baby, I'm like a fool for love. But like I said, I took to following her. Got so I was always late to my own classes. I was like a ranch dog, busy getting the prize filly fully into the corral. Even though I kept a certain distance, it was a matter of time before she came to notice me. And one day she just turned around and walked back to me where I had stalled out holding my breath. She thrust her books and stuff into my hands and said, might as well make yourself useful. <laughs> and from then on, I'd be there waiting for her when she came out of her class. And I'd escort her through the, the hustling mob right up to the door of her next class and transfer her belongings back into her custody. And one of her friends would say, well, you gotta give him points for persistence. <laughs> the first time our lips touched, just a week or so after we spoke, was by her locker way back in a dark corner of the maze of metal cabinets. It was after the last class, around dusk. She dawdled with her friends, sensing my impatience, knowing I had made my mind up to make my move. I don't know how she knew. <laughs> she, she did. She always seemed to be able to see the truth of me inside, my heart or soul or whatever you want to call it. Anyway, I had seen this picture of Elvis kissing a girl in a dress with thin straps, but bearing her shoulders, not a girl, a woman with clip-on earrings. 
But what got me was, he had her backed up against a metal railing. And she's got her right hand on the pipe, kind of bracing herself. And he has his hands on her waist, gently, but firmly. And they're kissing. But really, they're just touching the tips of their tongues, delicately, like butterflies. So that's what I did. I held her like that my hands firmly on her narrow waist and I pressed against her pushing my hips against hers I didn't rush I moved in slow and I smiled and she smiled and I slid my tongue out between my lips still smiling and she took the hint peeked the end of her tongue out and then I moved in closer and it was like a spark jumped between us our tongues were twisting and turning around each other. You ever seen snakes fucking? Like that. And then we were swirling and falling and soaring all at once. And we were grinding our molten bodies against each other. And I took both of her hands in mine, entwining our fingers, and raised our arms above our heads, forming two X's, melded, conjoined, on fire. <laughs> and on, we were pretty... We're pretty much doomed. <laughs> Blissfully doomed. If I got 10 feet from her, I'd get such a hard on so quick, I'd almost pass out from the rush of blood to my dick. And when I came, I came like a river. And she, well, she'd climb on top of me and ride me like a bronco buster. She'd grab my hair with her left hand like it was reins, wrapped in her grip, spurring me onto a gallop with her right hand. She'd stick four fingers in my mouth and her thumb under my chin and use my skull like the pommel of a saddle, just pounding it into the mattress or the floor or dirt, buckling her hips and butt at about a million t miles a minute. We got so crazy, we cut class and climbed in the back of some random car in the po school parking lot and just go at each other like there was no tomorrow. Then came the night when I followed my dad. I don't remember anymore why I did that that particular night. I guess I had to. Nothing to do with her. She is from a different planet, as far as I could tell. A place where everything was right. Where I was kind of a king, as long as she was queen. And besides, we really didn't talk that much. We already knew all the answers to the questions we cared about. But my dad and me, <laughs> we were always at war. He'd get all liquored up and come at my mom, and I'd step in, and the battle was on. One night, he broke every window in the place methodically. And then he upended the fridge to block the door. So I went out the shattered window of my room, cutting my hand on the jagged shards. One time he threw a lamp <laughs> at the television set, which didn't work anyway. It was only a black and white to boot. Something was tearing him up. Something more than just us. More than just the rocks and the garbage and the sheer helplessness of being poor and trapped. There was the time before all this when he challenged me to a foot race. I was maybe 15. Not that long before I met her, I guess. My dad and me used to race all the time just for fun, blow off steam. And he would always beat me. Something was bugging him that day, though. He wasn't drunk yet, just a little buzzed, and he came up to me grinning, loose and friendly. Hey, you think you can beat me now, boy? Those legs long enough yet? Come on, say we race to that oak tree. I was mad that day, too. He's pissing me off fairly regular. So we both ran it to win. And I was way ahead for most of the dash, about 30 feet from the finish line. I heard him huffing and puffing and coming up behind me, making this high-pitched moan and hissing like one of those old steam engines. Then, with an agonized, ragged roar, he passed me. His limbs pinwheeled like a cartoon. I reached down inside for a burst of speed and came up short. He beat me, leaving me gasping, completely depleted. And I looked over at him, kind of proud of him, actually. Then I saw his face, scarlet and pale at the same time. He's puking his guts up. Fear, hate, 
disgust with himself, glistening in his eyes. After that, we were more or less lost to each other. So one night, months after I'd met her, he got all cleaned up like he did sometimes. He even combed his hair, splashed himself with cologne, never looked in my mom's direction. And she just ignored him as he strolled out into the sultry night, whistling. And I followed him all the way to the other side of town, keeping my distance, but never losing sight of him. Shit, I could have followed him from the fumes of old spice coming off of him. <coughs> Eventually, he came to a small house, way past needing a new paint job. He strode right up to the front door, wide open, but the screen door closed. And he tapped lightly, <laughs> standing there like a returning war hero. And two women came to the door, one hanging back, while the other one, my mom's age, with radiant auburn hair, clad in a sim simple summer dress, showing some cleavage, threw her arms around my dad, gave him a righteous kiss. Then she mussed up his careful comb job, and they both laughed and then turned to the other woman who was standing back and holding the screen door open. And she moved into my dad's arms too. And he gave her a kiss on the top of her head. And as she stepped into the porch light, I could see her clearly. The shine of her hair, blonde with a mist of red. Oh, God. May. The other woman was a girl and the girl was May. And I knew right away. I knew for certain sure. And my cock got as hard as it's ever been. Ever. And then I was like, I was hypnotized. Or under a black magic spell, some juju. I stumbled toward the sad little house. Out of the shadow, across the street into the dusty, bereft yard, into the yellow light from the porch, and I said her name. And then they all turned to look at me. Each of them had such different expressions. The woman with the auburn hair looked puzzled, but not unwelcoming. My dad was more furious than I've ever seen him. Uh, murderous. Betrayed. And there was May. Looking like she had always known, and now I did, and hating me, and loving me, and sad as hell, and wanting me so much that she could barely keep herself from leaping off the porch and straddling me right there on the dead grass. So I ran. And I kept running all the way across the draggled town to the outskirts where our own woeful house still stood, emitting the blue light of the replacement TV, where my mom sat watching some western all alone. And I slipped in through my bedroom window silently, grabbed some stuff, T-shirts, socks, a few books, and I lit it out. And I never went back to that house or that town, except in secret when I was searching for May. But she fled soon after that night herself, although sometimes she'd drift back home. I just stayed on the rodeo. I shacked up in cheap motels on the ramble. And I tracked May down when I could, and we would be right back to that moment, pressed against that locker right as rain. No. I never got shot of me. And I never will. I don't care about the right or the wrong or the sideways. I don't exist without her. Without her, I don't want to exist. She's my everything. And that's exactly how it happened. Mm -hmm. wow.